Some of you have already asked me, and yes, I did have a wonderful time in Germany. I got to see a bunch of Luther and Bach sites, and well, Laura was a very good sport about it all. But one thing that I was excited about that I didn't get to do was to go through the Christmas markets. Before I left, one of my colleagues had told me about those markets. He said, oh, you'll be right there, there right as the markets begin to open. They're wonderful. You have to go see them. And sure enough, when we arrived in Wittenberg on Thanksgiving Day, I could see that they were already beginning to set up a bunch of booths in the main square. We had hoped that some of them would open up the next day. But when I saw a flyer for the market, I realized that everything was opening on Monday, right after I had left. Of course, I was disappointed, but the more I thought about that, the more I realized that it was a perfect image for the beginning of Advent, because we all know that Christmas is on its way. Advent has begun to fill us with hope that Christmas is coming soon. But Advent, and today's readings in particular, also reminds us that there are other signs demanding our attention in the world around us. There are disturbances on nearly every continent, There is distress among the nations. Russia and Ukraine are in conflict. I saw on the news when I was over there that Brexit Brexit is maybe going to happen or maybe not. Parts of the migrant caravan showed up at the U.S.-Mexico border this past week. And then the news that I saw live on CNN World as they broke in, live from Michigan, not what you expect to hear on the news in Germany. GM's announcement of layoffs and plant closures that will at least indirectly, if not directly, affect all of us in southeast Michigan. And that's to say nothing of the personal struggles that many of us face in our daily lives with work or family or health that make us think it's the end of the world as we know it. Any one of these things could cause us to tremble, as today's gospel says. People will faint in terror, apprehensive of what is coming into the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. In other words, the world is a mess, and we humans can be a mess too. Now, I know that doesn't feel like a very Christmassy message, And yet Jesus said these things to prepare his people for the destruction of the temple, an event so significant, so dramatic that it would shake the very foundation of their lives. At the same time, although the disciples didn't understand it then, Jesus was also preparing them for the destruction of his body. In both respects, Jesus is talking about a big change to come. And he tells his people, be on guard. Be alert, for it will come upon you and all who live on the face of the earth. And yet, here we are today, lighting candles and singing songs of hope. Here we are praying for peace. Here we are counting down the days to Christmas. Here we are teaching our children about Advent wreaths. And the story of a baby born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. The question is, why? Why bother with everything going on in the world? Shouldn't we be fainting in fear? Shouldn't we be preparing for the end of the world as we know it? Then again, what if the best way to prepare is to have hope? to go about each day with those words of Jesus from today's gospel. Stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Don't be caught with your head in the sand or your eyes on the ground. Stand up, look around, and see what God is doing. Because the God of redemption and new life is always at work in the world. 
continuing his sermon in the temple, Jesus reminds us how when we see trees sprouting new leaves at the end of winter, we, we naturally think of summer. Oh, wonderful, summer is coming. We get excited because we know from experience that new leaves are signs of new life. So also, Jesus says, when you see these things taking place, even terrible things, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Of course, it's easy to have hope when the trees are sprouting and the flowers are blooming. It's much harder to hope when your entire field of fig trees is uprooted. Even still, Jesus tells the people of faith, hope should be your response in every circumstance because we know our redemption is drawing near. The kingdom of God is at hand. The baby is about to be born. To be clear, terrible things continue to happen in the world. There's great sorrow, there's great struggle, great worry about what will happen next. But no matter what signs and events are happening around us, whether they're natural or human-made disasters, we respond with hope. Because these events, these signs, these powers and principalities do not write the story of creation. Brokers of injustice and hatred and fear do not have the power to rewrite the greatest love story ever told. We've already heard this great love story, the one we all sang about in the entrance hymn this morning, the story of a heaven-sent child to save us, who walked with us and shared our joys and sorrows, who died on a cross and rose on Easter morning to set us all free. No bad news, no crisis, no principality or power in this world has the power to change that story. Signs may point to disaster. The news may make us afraid. Politicians may point to war. Still, we know that while heaven and earth may pass away, the promises of God will not. Our God remains the God of redemption, the one who raises the dead to new life. This hope sustains us even when the world seems to be falling apart around us. I was reminded of that when I was in Leipzig. There at St. Nicholas's Church, they had an exhibit about the Monday demonstrations that began right there at St. Nicholas on September 4th, 1989. Every Monday, this congregation, this little congregation of Lutherans actually, would offer prayers for peace. But on that particular day, a group gathered and began a nonviolent protest to demand the right to travel and to elect their own government in East Germany. They did that every Monday for a month. And after a month, the gatherings, which started out with just a few hundred, had grown to more than 70,000 people, all united in peaceful opposition to the East German regime. Two weeks later, the crowds had swelled to over 320,000 people, over half the population of Leipzig. And the protests began to spread to other cities as well. That's what ultimately led to the fall of the Berlin Wall and the East German government and the reunification of Germany. I think that's the power of hope. In the midst of anxiety and fear and unrest, a few Christians gather to pray for peace and to live in hope for the future. And as they did, fear and injustice gave way. Friends, the season of Advent is short, but in these four weeks, we bring to the forefront of our lives what faithful disciples are to be doing all year long, during these four weeks, we practice hope. We light candles in darkness. We gather as a community to share meals and pray. We prepare our homes to welcome guests. We share food and gifts with family and friends. We teach our children the story of God's love for the world. 
and we sing. We sing songs of hope, trusting in Jesus who said that although some things would pass away and even some terrible things would happen, even so, through him our redemption is drawing near. So be alert. Stand up. Lift up your heads, Jesus says. And together, let us be on the lookout for signs of new life, even in the winter, even in the darkness, even in sickness, even in conflict. For the days are surely coming, says the Lord, when the world as we know it will end, and in its place, peace will be born. Kindness will be born. Justice will be born. And the kingdom of God will come in all its glory. Amen.